I am a Europhile. I know what you're thinking, and the answer is no. I have not been handsomely bribed by my German friends tonight to say that. <laughs> However, you, you, you would not be surprised, you might strike some of you as bizarre then, that I find myself on the proposition tonight. But I hope by the end of the debate that every single one of you here today will do the very same thing. For the motion tonight is not subjective. There are clear flaws of the EU that can show it as a threat to democracy. In fact, these flaws are so obvious that it's simple fantasy to believe that they do not exist. But that does not necessarily make the EU an inherently bad institution. Tonight, I'm not here to talk about reforming the EU. Tonight, I do not wish to invoke the emotional response often associated with the topic. Tonight, I will focus solely on the objective question of whether the EU poses a threat which undermines democracy. My arguments tonight as to why the EU poses a threat that undermines democracy will be threefold. Firstly, that the EU is a threat to democracy by its very institutional makeup. Democratic process is both undermined by the various institutions of the EU, how their members are elected, and how they interact with one another. And also by the sheer mind-boggling level of bureaucracy that seems to plague the EU these days. Secondly, that the EU is a threat to democracy because within the system, there exist certain groups who exercise a greater influence than should ever be allowed in a democracy. These groups use their usually more impressive financial, political or social standings to force the rest of the EU into policies they might not, even, they might not want or even need. Finally, my last point will be that in an economic and political union of 28 member states with 24 official languages and over half a billion people between them, it's nigh on impossible to have a real and meaningful democracy that does not compromise individuality and a nation's identity and voice. Now, on to my first point, that the EU's inherent institutional makeup is a threat to democracy. The EU itself is made up of smaller, um, numerous smaller institutions. Of these institutions, the people, i.e. you, of Europe, only vote directly for one, the European Parliament. The other indirect manner, of course, which you vote is that for voting of your national governments, who in turn decide and appoint members to sit on the Council of Ministers. This arguably does not provide sufficient legislative accountability as it is unclear who the people should blame when they essentially vote twice to different bodies for roughly the same purpose. However, beyond this loose legislative, accountab legislative accountability, there is a much bigger problem here with regard to the executive branch and arguably the European Central Bank as at no stage do any one of you vote for any member of those institutions. Quite frankly, there is next to no direct accountability to the people, and yet they, in, they exercise a sufficiently large amount of power. In the words of Tom Stoppard, it's not the voting that's democracy, it's the counting. And in this case, your votes count for very little. Beyond the flaws of the institutional makeup, it is a well-known fact, in Europe at least, that bureaucracy is king. This undermines, undermines democracy for two reasons. Firstly, it prevents transparency within the system. And secondly, it creates the classic example of too many cooks who in turn will spoil your broth by distorting the will of an electorate through the application of unnecessary and contrived loopholes that must be manoeuvred for any legislation to be implemented. The first issue of transparency concerns the fact that legislation, is subject to su that legislation subject to such bureaucracy is ultimately confused when one comes to ask where does it come from and who does it serve? My latter point is perhaps even more serious for there is simply an insane and constant stream of legislation that is churned out by the EU, often doing nothing more than confusing national governments and their people. To illustrate my point, I would like to compare the number of words found in various important historical documents. The Lord's Prayer contains an efficient 66 words and supposedly puts you in touch with the divine, so it's doing very well there. The American Constitution, with all 27 amendments, reaches an impressive 7,818, and this is the document on which a global power is built on. I'm reliably informed that the Union Rules comes in at 11,000, so congratulations to the Union for having more words than the American Constitution. 
<laughs> Arguably more influence, but that's a story for a different day. <laughs> However, the crux of the matter, ladies and gentlemen, is that EU regulation for the sale of cabbage comes in highest with 26,911 words. <laughs> Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is quite simply a ludicrous state of affairs. Not only does this make creating Europe European legislation a nightmare to implement, but it fundamentally undermines any member state's national democracy, for it too is subject to these ridiculous regulations on cabbage and is forced to comply regardless of the will of the people and their feelings towards cabbage. For the EU directives are often directly incorporated into a country's law with no option for discussion or amendment as to the sale of cabbage. And I can't stand this, ladies and gentlemen. This is terrible. <laughs> now, jokes aside, my second main argument tonight is that within the EU, certain groups have come to dominate discussion and decision over the Union's future. One can easily look towards France and Germany, mm -hmm. or as I shall affectionately call them, the Franco-German axis, to, to find examples of how they prioritise their national interests above the interests of Europe as a whole. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I could bore you with a list of cases where such dominance was shown, but in the interest of time, I shall simply state that I cannot think of a time, and I fully accept that, you know, could be my fault, where these two countries were meaningfully split over an issue that concerned the whole of Europe. This is fundamentally, fundamentally contrary to democracy and undermines the entire system even further. In addition, it seems very fair to state that Angela Merkel acts as the effective head of Europe. This is a leader who has been voted in by 40% of the German electorate, which in real terms, translate to about 5% of the EU electorate. In, such case, in, in most such cases, an electoral backing of 5% would not get anyone elected to an illegitimate body. Having done the maths, with 5%, Mrs Merkel would not have even been elected to Secretary's Committee this term at the Union. <laughs> Surely, when the self-imposed leader of the European Union cannot translate electoral success to this illustrious society, then we can say without a shadow of a doubt that democracy is failing, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Moreover, the existence of unelected cabals, such as the Frankfurt Group, further threatens the democracy within the EU. It was most correct of our former female prime minister to notice that Europe is a place teeming with ill-intentioned persons. These factions are the most dangerous threat to democracy for their undue influence on countries seems to know no bounds. Not one only has to look at Greece and Italy to see how these groups have forced democratically elected leaders out of office and in their place put puppet technocrats such as Mario Monti and Papademos who will do their bidding. The abuse of power stems even further into policy implementation. They forced draconian measures on Greece. And when George Papandreou told them that he would have a referendum and let the people decide, he was ousted within a week. Not only is this an insult to democracy, but it is not the manner by which anything other than tyranny operates. Imposed measures do not lead to success. They lead to a breakdown of trust a loss of order and the end of democracy. Measures must be voted by the people, not dictated by leaders, especially not when such leaders have not ever been voted for by the very people that the measures seem to affect the most. This is nothing new, however, in the EU's long, illustrious history. One only needs to look to Ireland's referendum on the Nice Treaty to see that despite it being rejected first time round, it was told, nope, try again come back with the desired result. My final argument tonight will be that the size and diversity present in the EU simply does not allow for any meaningful and real democracy to exist. The, novelly and, uh, the novelist, sorry, Anthony Armstrong once wrote that the only way to get anything done in a democracy is to, have is to take someone out to lunch. Now, unfortunately, this doesn't really apply to the EU. I mean, just consider how long it would take everyone to order the starters. But however, there is a serious point here. Now, while democracy is a cherished political institution, so too is cultural diversity. An individual's pride in that culture, be it for their language, their food, their clothes. 
It is, it is these small things that make you an individual and allow a nation's identity to develop. By seeking to create a truly democratic juggernaut, all that will arise is the undermining of these other equally important principles. Therefore, it cannot simply be, it simply cannot be the case that the EU could ever be anything other than a threat to democracy without removing the nation's unique identities and voices. It would be a total tragedy to allow such a state of affairs, so beyond all the arguments that I have put before you thus far this evening, spare a thought to consider that perhaps this threat to democracy, while present, is potentially incredibly necessary. In conclusion, there is no logical or objective analysis that leads to any alternate answer beyond identifying the EU as anything other than a threat to democracy. Its lack of accountability, its inflated bureaucracy, the systems abuse by small interest group and its high level of diversity mean that it can never truly function as a democracy. And for these reasons, I urge you tonight to vote with the proposition and thank you very much for listening.